All right, so welcome everyone to the July RR Clan seminar. My name is Dr Zoe Michaelif and I'm the Research Operations Manager for Northern New South Wales Local Health District. Today, we're moving on to part two of our three-part qualitative research mini-series, and I'm delighted to be joined by Dr David Schmidt, who'll be presenting on qualitative methodologies selecting the right lens. But before we get on to that, we'll go through our, um, our mandatories. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters where we work and live. We acknowledge the traditional custodians living culture, their connection to country and their contribution to the life of this region. We pay our respects to the ancestors and elders of the region to where all joining today. So today we're joining on Bundjalung land where I am um, and to all Aboriginal people past, present and future and to any Aboriginal people joining us here today. Welcome. I'm delighted to say that the RR Clan is uh, supported by the University Centre for Rural Health in the Northern Rivers, and we'd like to, to um, yeah, send out our biggest thanks to them for their support for the administration and running of these seminars. In case this is your first time for attending the RR Clan seminar series, just a little bit of background. So the Rural Research Collaborative Learning Network, otherwise known as RR Clan, is a collaborative partnership comprising of 13 New South Wales local health districts, the New South Wales Health Education and Training Institute, otherwise known as HETI, the Ooh. Tropical Australian <laughs> Academic <laughs> Health Centre, and eight Queensland Hospital and Health Services, and the Darling Downs Health and Innovation Research Collaborative. The RR Clan is a grassroots, rurally-led initiative that aims to provide high-quality research, education and training to healthcare staff working in rural, regional and remote areas. So really, our aim is to provide you with the education and training opportunities to build key skills in how to use and undertake research to improve the care that you deliver. Just in case you've missed any of the RR Clan seminar series, we do record every seminar and we post them to our RR Clan YouTube channel. I'll pop the link in the chat just shortly. Um, these recordings are available shortly after the seminar and any time you register, even if you're unable to attend, you're able to then access these recordings thereafter. Just a bit of housekeeping. So given uh, the, the large attendance, we have muted your microphones. And please feel free, if you don't wish to record, be appearing on the recording, please turn off your cameras. We would love interaction though, and I know David's got some questions throughout his presentation. So in the first instance, if you can direct all your questions to the chat, and if we do have time left over at the end, we will open the floor to take some live questions as well. So as I mentioned, um, we're in the middle of our three-part qualitative miniseries. Last month, we took a dive into qualitative research, which was presented by a prof Di Redlinger from Bond University and Dr Kate rogers Jewell, who is a conjoint academic with both Bond University and Northern New South Wales Health. And this month, we're moving on to qualitative methodologies, selecting the right lens. And we've got the fantastic David Schmidt with us today from Hedy. Uh, and before the seminar finishes today, we will move on and registrations will be open for our final uh, part in the mini series, which is the qualitative data analysis in health services research being presented by Dr. Olivia King. So stay tuned. There's more quality, more qualitative action coming your way. It now gives me great pleasure to now introduce you to Dr. David Schmidt. So David is a Senior Manager for Rural Research with the Health Education and Training Institute, HEDI, which is part of New South Wales Health, and he's a passionate advocate for rural clinician-led research. He's completed a PhD in research capacity building within the rural health workplace, and you might have heard of talking before the seminar, but he's also a cartoonist, and in a previous seminar, he's talked about a frog that lives in his letterbox named Mr. Grumpy. And unfortunately, I don't think either are making an appearance today. But that said, we're in for a great session and I'd like to hand over to you now, David. Welcome. Thank you very much, Zoe. And apologies for interrupting your, your dialogue flow with my woohoo for Hetty. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Um, 
Yes, uh, Mr. Grumpy the Frog is in winter hibernation and battered old Rex comics have, have gone into hibernation too just at the moment. So uh, it's fantastic to talk to you today about qualitative methodologies. I'd like to add my own um, acknowledgement that we meet today on Aboriginal land. I'm coming to you from the traditional homes of the Jerangans people of the Ewan Nation. So that's far south coast near South Wales. And just a reminder, next week is NADOC week. So make sure you find out about what NADOC celebrations are happening in your area and get along. Okay, now during this session, whoa, got a hand up. Got a question early, no? Yes, no? I'll keep going and someone will interrupt me if needs be. Um, Zoe, can you see my screen there? Just to clarify? Yes, sure can. Excellent. So during the session, we're going to cover the difference between methodologies and methods. And uh, I know Diane Kate touched on this briefly last session, but we'll see if we can tease that out a little bit. I'm going to talk you through some of the more common quali qualitative methodologies that you'll see in health research. And we're going to introduce these ideas about describing and interpreting and what that might mean for the, the lens that you choose. So going on to how to choose a lens, a brief discussion on Indigenous and Western approaches and what that might mean, but then some nuts and bolts about how methodology affects your methods and how to build reflexivity and rigor into it. So that's everything that we'd like to cover, and it's not going to be in that order, but that's the order that I had it on the intro um, blurb, so I thought I'd, I'd stick with that. Now, I do want to start with a bit of a disclaimer. When I went through... Uh, my undergraduate degree last millennium. Um, I went through as a physiotherapist and for uh, other physios out there, we're sometimes known as black and white concrete. So everything is really real and that's it's all facts and, and qualitative research wasn't even mentioned. Um, so that was where I started and it's been a bit of a journey of discovery for me doing um, qualitative research over the years. But I'm, what I'd like to do today is bring a really practical approach to qualitative research. And as part of that, I'd like to acknowledge that sometimes the language around qualitative research can be intimidating. Uh, that's in part because a lot of it came from a philosophy background, and that's not necessarily a background that we know so well here in health. So I'm going to give you a high level overview and as Zoe's pointed out, this sort of dive, uh, the dive in that we did last session with Kate and with Di um, was a bit of a, the, the first session, we're building on that and then we're leading into the next session uh, on qualitative analysis with Liv, uh, Dr. Olivia King next time. So that's where it all sort of fits. But speaking of where things fit, some of the concepts that got talked about last time were around ontology and epistemology and methods. Uh, and methodology was left open for me to talk about. And um, this is sort of how it fits. So uh, Di and Kate, for those who didn't see last session, um, please go and check it out on YouTube. It's, it's well worth it. It gives you a, a really good introduction to qualitative research. But some of the concepts underpinning qualitative research is this idea of ontology, which is you know, the nature of reality, and epistemology, how knowledge is constructed. And then well, last time, Di and Kate skipped straight ahead to methods, which is the things that we do to collect and understand data. So things like doing uh, interviews or focus groups or uh, doing observation or um, doing thematic analysis. So those are the kinds of things that we do, the methods, the nuts and bolts. Methodology sort of sits in between those big picture concepts of, you know, the nature of reality and how do we construct knowledge and the practical section of the things we do to collect or understand data. So methodology is sort of that bridge and it's I'm using so many metaphors, so I'm going to get confused here. We've got a bridge, we've got a lens. I'm going to stick with the word lens. It's the way we look at things. I'll expand on that in a little bit, but just in terms of some of the language you might see, 
um, around this is that when we're looking at a qualitative lens or a methodology, um, and this is my really, you know, nuts and bolts way of explaining qualitative research. When we want to capture someone's perspective, we need to think about whose eyes do we want to see through? Whose, whose shoes do we want to stand in? Uh, or whose shoulder do we want to look over? We want to capture someone's perspective. So that's one part of the story. But the other part is, what are you looking at when you look? We'll, we'll unpick that with an example in just a sec. Um, but some of the other terms you might hear instead of qualitative lens is things like theoretical approach or philosophical underpinning or conceptual foundation. And all of those sound big or intimidating, but essentially they're talking about a very similar thing. Whose perspective are you looking to capture? And when you look over their shoulder, what are you looking at when you look? Okay, so we're going to start with a little scenario. A person with mental health crisis presents to emergency with their carer. They are met at the triage desk by the triage nurse who assesses the person and speaks briefly to the carer. I'd like you to have a think for just a minute and have a think about whose perspective can we capture and what things could we look at? So I'm just going to shush for a minute and give you a chance to think. And if you're feeling bold, you might want to put your thoughts into the, the chat box. But I'm going to preempt some of the answers we might see. So perspectives we might look at. OK, we could want to understand the patient's perspective. And what was it like when you turned up with mental health in a mental health crisis at the emergency department? Or we might want to look over the carer's shoulder. Or we might want to see things from the triage nurse's perspective. And, you know, we might want to capture their experiences. What was it like for you? If we look a little bit broader, though, we might be able to see some other things. So we've had that interaction between the patient, the carer, and the triage nurse. But the ED nurse manager might have a perspective on that interaction and how we manage uh, people attending in mental health crisis. The mental health team who don't get to see the person at triage, but do get to see them shortly after, we might want to capture their perspective. Or if your hospital's big enough to have a patient flow manager and they have an interest in uh, how quickly people move through the, the facility or the data manager who has to report on triage categories and triage times back to the ministry who more often than not is the ED nurse manager, I appreciate, but you know, there might be a data manager. So, you know, there, there are other people who might have a perspective on this and we might want to capture their perspective. But beyond the individual experience, we might also, when we're looking over their shoulder, the patient, the carer, the mental health team, we might be looking at the system that they operate in, or we might look at the language that was used during the triage? You know, how did the person speak to you? What words did they use? Did they, um, did they use body language that was open and accepting? Uh, we might look at the structure of the ED setup and how, how client friendly it is. Or if we're getting a little bit more interpretive, and I'll come to that word interpretive in a minute, we might be looking at the power relationship between staff and clients or staff and carers or between patients and carers. Or we might want to look at the ED culture. Qualitative research will let us do all of those things. Um, not in the one study. We would need different lenses to explore different questions. And so that's why there isn't just one right way of doing qualitative research, because the things you're looking at 
and the perspective you're looking from will influence what you see and will therefore influence what you report back to other people about what you see. Now, I want to take a little bit of a detour here and just briefly speak of Indigenous and Western approaches. Um, and I'm a non-Indigenous man, um, and I grew up very much in the Western approaches of research, where you've got your scientific method and your philosophies that underpin things. And it's very much researcher driven. Uh, I have a question that I want an answer to. I go and get the answer uh, myself, or if I work for New South Wales Health, the organisation that employs me owns that data. And then we create a narrative based on what I understand and share. Um, and in some ways, my organisation might have a, an influence on the way that that's communicated and shared. If we look at Indigenous approaches and um, I've taken this from Kovacs paper in 2015, which is um, a, a good little book chapter if you can get a hold of it. Um, it has a different approach. It's not so much about the researcher being the one who's deciding and is being in control. It's more about collectivity. It's doing things together. Um, there's this notion of reciprocity. What we do in research involves giving back to the community. Um, so very, things are very much based around relationship and very much based around respect. Um, but also there are um, understandings around knowledge systems um, and that knowledge is not necessarily an individual thing, it's a collective thing. And that it is not something that can necessarily be given away. It's something that continues to be owned or held by community. Uh, so obviously with that, there are some Indigenous methods approaches, uh, some methods that are used in Indigenous research that are much more appropriate, much more participat participatory. And we'll talk about one of those a little bit later. Now, I'm not an Indigenous researcher. Um, I've, I've explained that, um, but there are different ways of doing. I guess is a short way to put it. Now, I do want to make it clear that just because someone might be Aboriginal, they don't have to use Indigenous research methods. They could quite happily use Western research methods if that was their choice. Um, what I'm saying is that there are you know different ways of knowing, being and doing. And I'm bringing things very much from the Western approaches. I think some of the things from Indigenous research methods, such as doing things together, basing things around respect and relationship and giving back to community, is something that would be really good for all researchers to integrate in, into what they do. I want to just introduce a couple of concepts here. And again, this is kind of big picture and I am simplifying a little bit. so. Bear with me if there's any uh, methodological purists out there. Um, feel free to let me know in the chat um, if I've oversimplified. Uh, but sometimes when it comes to qualitative research, we need to make a decision around whether we want to describe what people say or describe uh, people's opinions on something or whether we want to be more interpretive, whether we want to get behind their words. And um, just as a really quick example of, you know, because sometimes people go, what do you mean describing or, or interpreting? If someone says, you know, if I pick up a piece of paper and 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 it says, um, you know, the teenager said, yes, it was great. Um, that's describing what they said. If we'd have been in the room and heard, heard them say, oh, yes, it was great. Uh, we would know that there is something sitting behind those words. They didn't mean it was great. Um, they actually said, yes, it was great. What did they mean when they said it? And what was behind the meaning? And some qualitative methods will be more towards that descriptive end or more towards the interpretive end. So descripting, descriptive, what did people say? less descriptive and more interpretive, what did they mean when they said what they said? 
or even more interpretive, what was behind them meaning what they meant when they said what they said? I'm just going to bring it back to our little example, the triage nurse person in mental health crisis care dynamic. We might interview the triage nurse and the triage nurse might say something like, mental health patients always take up a lot of time. Now, if we were taking a descriptive approach, we would say, the nurse said, mental health patients always take up a lot of time. If we were being a bit more interpretive and we might say, well, what did they mean when they said that? They might have meant, I don't have enough time to triage this person properly. And if we wanted to get even more interpretive, we could go, well, what was behind them meaning they don't have enough time? And what might be behind that is our systems make it really difficult to manage people with complex needs appropriately. So we've gone from mental health patients always take up a lot of time to our systems make it really hard with this intermediate step of what did they mean? I've got a question for you all, something to think about, and that is how did we get from what someone said to what they meant and beyond that into what was behind what they meant? And when you think about that process, just have a think about how that feels for you. Does that feel kosher? Does that feel like a giant leap? How does it feel? I'm going to stop talking for a minute and just give you a chance to think. And as always, feel free to put your comments or thoughts in the chat. Yeah, there's some really interesting thoughts in the chat there. Um, firstly, you know, we, we do run the risk of making assumptions, but we also do this interpreting what people mean all the time. It's built into what we do. Uh, it's a fairly natural process for us. Um, so some people, and again, this is getting into that qualitative analysis stage and some of the stuff that Olivia is going to cover next time will help us understand that process of getting from what was said more into what was meant. Um, I agree. Um, we need more data to make those interpretations or to follow the leaps. I just wanted to flag that early because there are some lenses that lend themselves more to being more descriptive and some that lend them more themselves more to being interpretive. And so they will help you know how far away from the data you can be. So some of these lenses will make you stay close to the data. Others will let you go off and theorize a little bit more. Hey, so that saying that some lenses allow you to be a little bit more interpretive, sometimes some people feel more comfortable being more interpretive. Um, but yes, you you do get to, to make some leaps. Um, you do have more data sources. And sometimes you have to bring people with you, as in, you need to talk people through how you got from what people said to what they meant. And that's part of the idea of communicating that research. Like I said, we do get to, uh, there are some lenses that do get to let you be a little bit more interpretive and some that le let you be a little bit more descriptive. What I'd like to do now 
is, again, very high level, skip through some of the more um, common qualitative lenses and where they are in that describe versus interpret uh, line and also what kind of questions are they really good at answering? Okay, so one you might see and we're seeing more, more and more of is qualitative description. And as you'd appreciate, it's got description in the name. It's really good at describing. And so if you wanted to do a study that asked the question, what did people say about this particular thing? This lens is a really good lens for answering that kind of question. So staying really close to the data and letting you compile what people said. A qualitative case study can be very descriptive or it can be a bit more interpretive. And it's helpful for us to answer a question, what, can, what picture can we build about this case? Now I've put case in, well then I should use quotation marks, shouldn't I? I've put it in half quotation marks. I don't, don't know what you call those. Anyway, um, a case in a qualitative sense isn't, what we think of when we think of a clinical case study where it's one person sitting in the bed and they've got a particular condition and we describe uh, what condition they have and what the symptoms were, etc. A case in this instance might be the interaction between nurse and patient and carer. So we might look at one episode of um, that interaction and we're building a picture about this case, the case being that triage encounter. Or we might do several of those and we might build up a picture of nurse patient triage encounters in mental health crisis in hospital A as the case and we're building up lots of different viewpoints on this particular thing. You can have multiple case studies that would be a case series, qualitative case series. It's really rare though, because people tend to lump them all together and call it a case study and expand their definition of what the case is. Interpretive description is one you'll see as well. Um, and it it's very much like we talked about in that flow between what did people say and what did they mean. This is getting behind what people said to what people meant. So it's still more towards that descriptive end, but a layer of interpretation is built in there as well. Phenomenology is very commonly used um, to capture the individual experience. What was it like for you when you experienced this thing, this phenomenon? So it might be that person presenting to ED with a mental health crisis is the phenomenon. So you want to talk to the people who have experienced this thing and say, what was it like for you? Excellent. I'm about to get timed out. OK, well, we'll see what happens in one minute's time, Zoe. Um, so, or it might be that you go, what was it like for you as a carer when you brought your, um, the, the person who was having mental health crisis to ED, or what was it like for you as the nurse? So as soon as you start asking that question, what was it like for you? Then my head starts to go into phenomenology. It's interpretive. There are some versions that are very interpretive, particularly one called IPA, which is not a kind of beer. It's interpretive phenomenological analysis. And if you've had the other kind of IPA, there's no way you can say interpretive phenomenological analysis. I can't even do it sober. So I have used phenomenology as one thing. There's actually lots of different subgroups within phenomenology and within a lot of these other lenses as well. There's different approaches where 
seconds. Okay. Am I still online? Because I just had something happen to my screen. You're still there, David. Yay! And can you still see my screen? We sure can. Double yay. Okay. Um, all right. So, yes, you see phenomenology, you start to think, what was it like for you? But there are different variants within. And as I said, this is a fairly high level approach. When you get into the detail, there's lots of different ways of doing something like phenomenology. Another one that we tend to see in health services research in particular is one called appreciative inquiry. And it comes from an organisational development background. Again, we can see we're getting more up the interpretive end. And it tends to ask questions like, what do we what do we do really well? What's good about this situation? What would the idea look like and how can we get there? So you can see that lens is moved well away from the individual what was it like for you experience and more into a sort of like a systems kind of approach. Um, one that I'm familiar with very much so is one called critical realism, which is where you start to build theories about what underlying mechanisms have led to things being are as being as they are. And this is one that you tend to see in you will see more in complex policy type areas. Really good for unpicking complicated stuff. Another one, and you can see it's right up the interpretive end. Uh, I was going to be cheeky and put it beyond the interpretive end, but I thought I wouldn't, um, is grounded theory. And grounded theory is what's a th what theory can we create to explain this situation? So you find people who have experience of a particular situation and say, you know, help me explain this and I will build a theory that's grounded in what you tell me. Um, but it's very interpretive. Now, I've been using this over critical realism and grounded theory. I've been using these phrases like create a hypothesis or develop a theory. Um, and that's not unique to those um, lenses, to grounded theory or to critical realism. All of qualitative research is about developing a theory or a hypothesis about why things are as they are. So when we think of research, often we think of particularly quantitative research where we have a theory that we want to go out and test. You know, does drug X work better than drug Y? I think it is better, so I'm going to test it. Um, or, you know, what happens if we do this particular thing, or is there a relationship between A and B? Um, that's what we tend to think of in, in research when we're not familiar with qualitative research, that we have a hypothesis that we go out and test, or if you're ultra researchy, a null hypothesis that you want to go out there and disprove. Um, whereas qualitative research is about generating theory. It's about creating new knowledge or new ideas about that might explain how things are as they are. So we're looking at putting together an explanation. Um, your explanation based on what you see and what people tell you and what you come to understand it means. So yes, not while I talk about grounded theory as being theory generating, all qualitative research is. Um, just different ways to get to it. Action research can be more descriptive or more interpretive. It's sort of, I put a big line there because it doesn't really fit in this kind of way of describing things. Action research is changing, understanding something by doing it. So help me understand a situation by helping me do something to change it. So you might want to implement a, a new model of care and you don't know what that's going to involve. 
So you might understand the new model of care by creating the model of care and describing as you go. Participatory action research is similar, but it's more based around the idea that instead of the researcher driving change, it's the participants that drive the change and are in control of the direction of things. So, you know, let's develop a shared understanding of the situation as you do something to change it. And you can see the change in language there being from well, I'm going to change something. Let's well, help me understand while we change. Let's learn together as you change it. And this kind of participatory approach works, is much more consistent with that kind of uh, working with community and doing, doing research with Indigenous community. So that the power residing with the participants rather than the researcher. Now I've talked through a whole stack. There's a stack and there's a stack more uh, pragmatism. You know, if, what, what's the useful thing here? Um, let's look for usefulness. Ethnography, uh, really good at studying culture. Um, and look, I've put these on here on this describing interpreting thing fairly arbitrarily. So just be patient with me if you think ethnography should be further one way or the other. Systems thinking, where we look at, um, you know, instead of looking at individual situations, we look at big picture systems. Discourse analysis, which looks at conversations and, and language flow. Hermeneutics, that looks at word choice, amongst other things. Feminism, which is a more emancipatory lens. Um, critical theory, which is really interested in power relationships and more. Um, I'm just going to put them under and many more. Uh, so there's, there's a stack and you don't start um, a study by going, I want to do a critical theory study. You start by working out what it is that you really want to know and who's got the answer to that question and how will you go about getting the answer to that question. And, and those three points are where I always start with a research project. What do I really want to know? Who's got the answer and how can I get it? But some of these lenses will help you see different things when you're looking over the shoulder of the person that you want to look over. So the big question is, how do you choose one? Well, we've talked about you know, picking a methodology that will answer the right kind of question. What was it like for you? Um, what can we understand about the situation? What Help me build a theory of what's going on here, but also has a description interpretation level that's appropriate to your audience. Now, if you are going to go and talk to a bunch of mm, finance people, for example, who are very comfortable with numbers and figures and you want to change their mind by presenting them some qualitative research. Um, if you come up with something very interpretive and you go, people told me that, uh, you know, that triaging mental health patients takes a long time and what was behind all of that is that they're feeling disempowered because of the lack of uh, autonomy in their role. Um, yet your audience might not be able to make that leap with you. Um, whereas if you're, so you might choose something more up the descriptive end. If your audience is mm, the health minister, who is, um, you know, we know politicians are swayed by stories. So you might use a narrative approach and say, here are some stories that people told me and here's the threads that hold them together. Because that might be the level of interpretation that's appropriate to that audience. So we wanna get the right kind of question. We wanna get that level of, of description or interpretation. You also want to have a qualitative lens that has a good resonance for you. One that feels right or one that you might be able to access guidance for. Now, we haven't talked about those last two points, 
I want to expand on those. So sometimes a qualitative methodology will feel right. It just makes more sense. Um, my PhD was underpinned by critical realism. I didn't know a lot about it, but I read a little bit about it and went, that's what I want to do because that just feels right. It's a great fit for me. Um, I've got a friend who's one of the best phenomenologists I'll ever meet. She's just awesome. She, she gets it. She gets phenomenology. Uh, but knowing how you see the world and how you understand um, this idea of, of knowledge creation, the way you use, yeah, the way you make sense of the world in your head will influence um, that fit. So for me, uh, physiotherapists, black and white concrete, a realist ontology, there is one reality that we all experience that makes sense to me. So critical realism has that. Um, everyone constructs their own knowledge of that reality. That makes sense to me. So critical realism has a constructivist epistemology. <sighs> Try saying that after a few IPAs. Um, but that, again, that, that sort of fits with my worldview. So that's comfortable for me. So you do need to know yourself, but it doesn't mean that you can only work in one qualitative methodology. Um, you know, I can do a grounded theory study if I want. I can do an ethnography study. Um, I might feel more comfortable looking at things in a critical realist way, but you know, you're not locked into that. Um, well, I don't believe so. And as a rural researcher, sometimes you need to be across more than one. But also, sometimes you need guidance, particularly if you're a novice researcher. Um, there are some qualitative methods that have methodologies that have really well established rules. You do things like this, you ask these kinds of questions, you analyze in this way. That's the formula. Um, other ones aren't as structured. Uh, some are really complex, and anyone wanting to have grounded theory as their first um, qualitative methodology, make sure you are teaming up with someone who's really experienced in that. Um, so aligning yourself with a researcher who's experienced in your methodology is really helpful or in my case with my PhD my supervisors didn't know critical realism uh, but they were willing to learn together with me so that was cool so just re-emphasizing good qualitative research is rarely if ever a solo pursuit and I would go so far as to say good quality any kind of research is rarely if ever a solo pursuit OK, so let's get back to our little scenario. We've got our person with a mental health crisis. They've come to emergency with their carer. They're triaged by the triage nurse who assesses the person and speaks to the carer. Let's choose a lens. So if the question we wanted to ask was, what was that encounter like for you as a carer? And we've decided, because of our audience, we want to try and sway the people who are in charge of policy around mental health triage. We want to stay really close to the words of the carer, don't care whether it's personal resonance or not or have guidance. We just want to go in and talk to people. So the second I see that, what was it like for you? I'm thinking phenomenology. And if we want to stay close to the words, we're going to choose a version of phenomenology that's a little bit more descriptive um, with a bit of interpretation put in there. So that's the right kind of lens for that. But what if the answer the question we wanted to answer was, what works well when people present to ED in mental health crisis? And we're happy to, you know, fly off a little bit if we get to find out, you know, get to the crux of things. Well, this, this sounds cool. This sounds sound exciting to me. Um, so what works well, we start to think appreciative inquiry. And if we're happy to interpret, great. We can create a vision of what could be. Um, you know, what would the ideal 
um, ED mental health crisis nexus look like? And that's the kind of process that can help you choose the right lens. What's the question we want to answer? And let's have a think about our audience, about how interpretive we need to be. So way back at the start, we had that slide where we talked about ontology, epistemology, methodology, and then methods. Let's have a look at how methodology affects your methods. So if we looked at the first example where we were using phenomenology, and we would want to do interviews with carers, more than one, um, you know, the more you talk to, the you make sure you capture these different, different experiences. And we'd be asking about you, the carer, and your experience in that situation. We'd compile themes and look behind it a little bit to get be get behind what people said to what they meant. Whereas with appreciative inquiry, we might go, um, again, interviews and focus groups. So same methods. Um, and we'd be talking to people who know the situation, but we'd be looking for different things. We'd be asking questions about what works well, what the ideal ED situation would look like, and what could we do to get closer to the ideal from where we are now. And with our analysis, we'd be focusing on strengths because it's a strengths-based methodology, or if there are negatives, we could then interpret those in terms of what could be. So if we look at that um, quote we had when we talked about getting from what people said to what they meant, um, someone says, Mental health patients take up a lot of time to triage through an appreciative inquiry lens. We could say that triage nurses are looking for a sufficient time to appropriately triage nurses, uh, triage nurses, triage mental health patients. Sometimes I think triage nurses want to triage their colleagues, but yeah. So that's that's a nice little example of people said we don't have enough time. But if we put those appreciative inquiry lens on, we can say people are looking for enough time. Now, to help people understand how you apply your lens and how you get from what people say to what they mean, um, there's this issue of reflexivity and rigor. Now, if you were someone who had presented to ED in mental health crisis uh, sometime in the past, and you or were a carer of the same, and you were the person doing that research, that would influence what you see. Or if you'd spent 20 years as a triage nurse, that would influence what you see. So you will need along the way to keep checking your assumptions. No. Did people really say that, or am I teasing that out from my experience? Uh, so writing field notes after interviews, keeping a, a research diary, those kinds of things can be really helpful, but also talking through things with other people. So when you go, they said this, what I think they meant was, other people, experienced members of your research team, uh, are possibly going to be saying, well, how do you know? How is how how did you get to that? Tell me why. Tell me why you saw it that way. Part of that will involve telling people about you. So if, for example, I walk into a room and I go, geez, it's dark in here, um, it would be helpful for you to know that I have transition lenses on my glasses and they turn into semi-sunnies when I'm outside. And then when I walk into a dark room, they take a little while to adjust. Uh, so when I first walk into a room, everything looks dark. Um, so that's what I mean. Tell people about you so they can understand why you have seen things the way you are, uh, where you are seeing them. So I spent 20 years as a triage nurse. So when I, when I see people come in and they tell me this, this is how it influences what I see. But the most important thing with reflexivity and rigor is to keep your methodology lenses on. 
So, how do you do that? This is this process of continually checking yourself. Have I designed my questions in line with my methodology? So am I asking about systems when I really want to know what was it like for you? Now you've got to make sure they match. Um, are my methods and processes consistent with my methodology? Am I interpreting things in line with my methodology? So if I'm using a strengths-based methodology like appreciative inquiry, am I interpreting things that are negative or am I looking to understand them in a way that is turning a negative into a potential strength? But also, can I help people see how I got to where I got to? Can I show people how my methodology helps explain the conclusions I've drawn? All of this is easier when you're talking through real stuff with experienced qualitative researchers. All right, quick recap. Um, there's lots of different qualitative methodologies and they guide what you look at and how you go about it, but there isn't one right way. Um, the way to get the best fit is to align your methodology with the kind of questions that you need to answer. So making sure you're capturing the right perspective and you're looking for the right thing when you look. Keep in mind that balance between interpretation and description Remember, research is a team sport and keeping your lenses on is essential for rigor. All right, I'm going to stop talking very shortly. Um, but just a reminder that our next session is on the 7th of August and Olivia King is going to help us take the next step um, by looking at qualitative data analysis. So I've taken us through that Picking a lens, um, Olivia is going to take us through, once you've talked to people, how do you make meaning from it? I'm going to throw back to Zoe to talk us through the last little bit. Did you want me to manage the slides or did you want to take over? That's Zoe? fine, David. Thank you so much. So stay tuned. Um, I've just popped the, the link to the registrations to Olivia's uh, seminar in the chat. So yep. registrations are open. So please feel free to jump on to finish our qualitative mini series. And lastly, next slide, please, David, thank you. Um, please let us know how we go. So take a minute before you go and while we've got some time for questions, uh, just to complete a short evaluation survey to, to let us know if what we're delivering is fit for purpose, how you enjoyed David's presentation, whether you found it useful. So the link is also in the chat. Um, I'd now like, like to open the floor up to any questions. Um, while we've got David, in his infinite wisdom. And can I just say, David, thank you for a wonderful seminar. I know I learned a lot and you put a lot of clarity around terms that I've heard, but and structures in place. So thank you. Is there and any Zoe, David, sorry, while people are waiting for or to ask questions, there was a question actually from Carol, David, and I think you'd be well placed to have a go at answering this one. The question was, Will the experience of health professionals in the implementation of an intervention lie more to phenomenology or simply descriptive? What are your thoughts there, David? Oh, I'm, going to, I'm going to be really frustrating and answer that with, it depends what you really, really want to know. Um, in the implementation of an intervention, I, I'm, I'm actually thinking that phenomenology is probably less helpful in that instance because it's not about you. It's about the experience of putting that intervention into place. So I would probably choose a different lens and maybe an interpretive description might be might give you a little bit more flexibility than phenomenology, which really hones in on that individual experience. But another question popped in. Yep. So where does the patient journey mapping fall on the continuum of qualitative methodologies? I knew I was going to regret that descriptive, interpretive, <laughs> continuum thing, and I'm right in the middle of it. Okay, uh, patient journey mapping, look, you can make it very descriptive. Um, you can make it very interpretive. And 
one of the things that patient journey mapping rarely happens just on its own. We don't just put a map up and go, you know, people's journey look like this. Um, we tend to do it with something else. And um, later on, I'll share back in the chat here, um, a study that was done in the Murrumbidgee um, local health district, which looked at patient journey mapping for bariatric people who come into the facility. And so there was some really good patient journey mapping and, and what were the, the sticking points and where do people have difficulties. But then that was matched to what was observed. So what people said and what was seen didn't necessarily match. Um, but then what people saw and what was seen didn't necessarily match what was in the existing literature as well. And so we had this wonderful little three-way comparison of what was said, what was seen, and what was known uh, from the literature, and then matching on all three of those, the sides of that triangle. It was a, a fascinating little study. So I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, I would I would probably tend to say patient journey mapping in itself tends to be fairly descriptive. Got me on my toes here. Awesome, great questions. Any other questions if anyone would like to come off mute? I think you've left a lot for people to think about. Um, just reading a comment in the chat. I think there's a lot of things that could be de debated here as well, David. Absolutely. Um, in case you're looking for another string to add to your bow, someone also commented that you've got a beautiful way of presenting and a great voice for podcasts. So that might be your next step in career moves. Oh, this is what the world needs, more middle-aged white men doing podcasts. <laughs> On that note, um, I'm going to say thank you so much, David, for a wonderful presentation. I'd like to thank Pleasure. everyone for attending today. Again, without you guys, it wouldn't be what we're doing. Um, and I hope you found it valuable. And we look forward to seeing you again in August with uh, Dr. Olivia King presenting our third and final qualitative mini series. So thank you very much and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.